Okay, let's begin. So this is, um, topic is Yirmiyahu. I will say that in all my teaching, in all the 40 years I've been teaching at Risha, even before that too, I never taught uh, Nevi'im at all. I, I mean, I teach biblical narrative for the most part. Omish, basically, Nevi'im Bishonim, Shmuel, Shoftim, Yeshua, Balachim, taught some of the Megillot, and uh, I never actually dealt with the poetry of the Bible, and I never dealt with the prophetic writings for the most part, with rare exceptions. So the choice of Yirmiyahu is an interesting choice. Yirmiyahu is a one of the main prophets that we have. The three big prophets in our canon are Yishayo, Yirmiyahu, and Yechezko. Yirmiyahu is different from the others. For, for one thing, the book of Yirmiyahu is, uh, contains many prophecies. Most of them are pretty negative. Uh, on the other hand, there's a fair amount of material in Yirmiyo that deals with the person. And what's interesting to think about is the relationship between the person and the, uh, and the, and the prophecy. Just to get some, before we begin to get some sense of the, the way the book is structured. So the, uh, it begins with the Yirmiyo, the first the first, I would say the first 25 chapters, basically, are chapters of most of the prophecies are prophecies about the imminent uh, destruction of the temple and the dispersion, the exile, etc. Interspersed in that, however, from time to time, there are moments of uh, light and hope. Uh, the first 25 chapters include amongst them okay. certain things that Yermio is supposed to do, and they also include very interestingly, um, some of Yermio's statements about himself. It's a book in which Yermio is torn between, on one hand, delivering God's message, which is a message of, of for, foreboding, and on the other side of it, he is a prophet who represents the people. We have to remember that the term Navi, first time we ever had the word Navi in the Bible, is in the book of Rashid. And it has to do with Abraham, where God speaks to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, and who had taken Sarah, and says, speak to this man, Abraham, he's a prophet. He'll pray for you and you will live. So it's the very first time we ever have in the Bible the term Navi. It applies to Abraham. And the definition of a Navi in that context is someone who prays for somebody else. You think of the greatest of the prophets of Moshe, it's certainly true that Moshe is delivering God's message. And in the case of Moshe, God roars to the people. On the other hand, on more than one occasion, clearly, Moshe is speaking on behalf of the people. Old in Kev, story of the Miraglim, etc. So we, the prophet is in two different places, one might say. The prophet is a connection between God on one hand and the people, bringing down God's word, and the other hand, the prophet is also a defender of the people. The uh, Bechilta actually talks about different prophets and talks about some who fundamentally see themselves as God representative. The case that comes to mind, like the most obvious case would be uh, Elio Hanavi. Mm -hmm. He's not uh, a, a, a feel good guy, you know what I mean? Elio Hanavi is a fanatic, obviously, but basically the first words out of his mouth are there shall be a famine. You're not keeping the Torah. The Torah says, if you don't keep the Torah, there's a famine. And he, he says, there will be no rain until I say so. So that's an example of a prophet who actually is one who primarily is uh, God's representative. The Mechilta, I believe, signals out Moshe as one who actually is the people's representative. Moshe is the one who prays for us and takes us out of Mitzrayim and prays for us, etc. And the Bechilta in the beginning of uh, chapter 12 of Shemot says the prophet who is actually both, the prophet who both brings God's word to the people, <coughs> but also was a defender of the people, is none other than Yermio, the book of Yermio. So that's at least one take on Yermio, and it's certainly true, and we'll encounter this, that from time to time he sort of bemoans his fate. We'll, we'll get to that. Why did you single me out for these, to deliver these, these messages? Anyway, that's the. So the prophets come in different, again, the prophet comes in different, uh, different, different roles, etc. And uh, 
the way the book is structured, <coughs> the beginning of the book, and we'll study this this morning, Debrei uh, Yirmiyahu is about the choosing of Yirmiyahu Yir as a prophet. There is in the book of Yirmiyahu, not too much of this, but there is in the book of Yirmiyahu, chapter 30, 31, 32, 33, there are pro prophecies also of, uh, of uh, consolation. Mm. And there are other prophecies which are, have an element of consolation in them. Not surprisingly, the prophecies of consolation often turn out to be the, uh, the, uh, the, the after road. The after of Rosh Hashanah, second day of Rosh Hashanah. Motzachen ba midbar am sri decherev, rochem vaka abonela, that's from the book of Yermiel. Now, something else that's interesting and important to recognize as we begin our study, and that is that the prophecies of Yirmiyahu, the, the beginning of the book, Divrei Yirmiyahu ben Chilkiyahu, min ha-kohanim asher ba-natot v'yeretz b'nyamin. So these are the words of Yirmiyahu. He was a priest from the priests that live in Anatot, in the land of Benjamin. Asher ayod v'ar Hashem elav, so the beginning of the book, the preamble to the book, tells us at what time Yirmiyahu uh, uh, prophesied. And it mentions specifically King Yoshiyahu. He's a very central figure in terms of the kingship of Israel. And it's discussed both in the book of Chronicles of Divrei Ayamim, and especially in Sefer Malachim. He has the Great Reformation. He discovers the Sefer Torah, Great Reformation, tries to abolish idolatry, etc. We'll get to him because many of the prophecies are in the days of Yoshiahu. And then the book singles out two other kings, Yehoiakim. He prophesied in, in the days of Yehoiakim, one of Yoshio's sons, until, up until Tzidkiyahu, another son of Yoshio, and the, and, the, and the exile. Now, truth of the matter is that actually the book of Yermio, and this is very interesting, he doesn't, the story of Yermio does not end with the story of, uh, of uh, Tzidkiyahu. The book doesn't end there at all. The book has two other features to it, which are very interesting. Hopefully we'll get to it at some point. And the plan is to do this for a year, and that's just one semester, you can't. It's 52 chapters, we're not gonna do everything. We wanna to get to the key points. There are two stories at the end of the book that are very important, we'll get to it someday. The first is that after Tzikyo is basically uh, removed from office, his family is killed and all that by the Bukhanetzar, uh, the Babylonians appoint a governor over the land of Israel, Gedalia ben, uh, ben, uh, ben Achikab. And Gedalia uh, reaches out to, to, to Yermio. Because Yermio in the book is always prophesying that we have to make our peace with the, uh, with the Babylonians. The Babylonians are going to be victorious. Don't try to fight them. Clean up your act. If you do that, you'll be able to live in peace in the land. And that's his consistent message throughout. So after the um, rebellions and Sikyo is uh, removed from office and Israel is banished, etc. Um, so, so the Babylonians say to Yermio, you, you, have, you, you can stay in the land if you wish, go wherever you want. First he's taken into exile or begins to be taken. And then the message is sent to the general of the Babylonians, tell Yermio, he can do whatever he wants. We're gonna take care of him. And Yermio wants to stay in the land with the, with, with, with the remnant of the people. There's a remnant still left. And the, and the Babylonians appoint Gedalia as the, as the governor. So Gedalia is, uh, is assassinated. The, the description of Gedalia is found at the end of the book of Yermiyahu. And after Gedalia is assassinated, which is a very important story, so the remnant that's left under the leadership of certain uh, people, Yochanan, etc., they decide they can't stay in the land. They're afraid to stay in the land because the Babylonians who appointed Gedalia are going to destroy the rest of us. And they asked Yermio, what should we do? They, they want to go down to, uh, to, 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 to Egypt. And Yermio says, well, I'll tell you, tell us what God says, you know? 
I think we've been in the situation. Tell, t- tell us what you what you want, you know? Tell us what God says. So Yermiel says, well, I'll tell you what God says on condition. After I tell you what God says, you obey what God says. No problem. No problem. Anyway, so he tells him what God says. God says, don't go. Don't go to Mitzrayim. Stay in the land. It's going to be okay. Um, so, yeah. So uh, after he tells them what God says, they decide they're not going to do what God says. And they go down to Egypt. Yemio goes with them. Whether he goes with them voluntarily or not is a very interesting question. But he goes with them and he prophesies in Mitzrayim. That's how the book ends, actually. He prophesies in Mitzrayim. He warns them about Mitzrayim. He warns them not to go. They go anyway. So Yemio, I would say, throughout the book, it's, it's very typical in a sense. Same thing of staying in the land. He could have gone to, to, to Babylonia, lived in a palace probably. He doesn't want to do that. He stays with the, with the poor people in the land. There's something about Yermio, which is very powerful about his understanding that has to be with the people. He doesn't abandon the people. It would have been easy for him to, to leave. He was offered actually to leave, but he decides not to do that. So the truth is that the prophecies don't end. The beginning of the book, you get a sense that the prophecies end with Zikio. That's not true. He continues to function in a very significant way, both in the story of Gedalia, which we'll hopefully get to, and then finally in the story of, of, uh, of uh, Mitzrayim. So that's an important point. I want to make a second point before we begin our study about the book of Yermio. The In the tractate Bava Batra, which talks about the, 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 both the authorship of the different books and also the, the order of the books. So in the tradition, Yermio is assumed to be the author of, of the book of Yermio. Uh, he's also assumed to be the author of the book of Kings. And he's also assumed to be the author of the book of Kinod, which we call Echa. These three books are ascribed in the tradition to, to Yermio. Whether it's based on a tradition, evidence, or whatever, or it means something else is a good question. The inscriptions in general have to be taken with several tons of salt, but it doesn't matter. The point is that and, and, and actually, in the Gemara, the, the order of the prophets is different than the order that, that, uh, that we have. The order that we have of the great prophet is Yeshayahu first, then Yermio, and then Yechezko. It's kind of a chronological order. Yechezko and Yermio overlap, actually. Yeshayahu precedes Yermio. Um, in the order in the, in the, in the, in the Gemara, it's Sefer Melachim, then Yermiyahu, then Yeshayahu. Well, Sefer Malachim, of course, is the book of exile, ends with exile. It's a book about how do we end up in this bad place. And since Yermio is a prophet of, of, uh, of doom, as it were, prophet of weeping, so in the tradition, in the Gemara, actually, Yermio follows uh, Sefer Malachim, but in all of the printed editions later, uh, that's not the case. And the, the, the way we have it, our traditions, for many, many hundreds of years, is that the order is actually Shayao, then Yermio, and then Yechesko. Let me make one other, two other points about the book as just introduction. It's very important in, in, in when you study Yermio to understand the, uh, the kind of historical background to the book. And the, the most important thing to understand is there are three main, there are many different nations out there, but, but in the book of, in the story that concerns us, there are three main nations that are very important for an understanding of the book of Yermio. One is Assyria, Ashur. The other is Mitzrayim. One's up north. And the other is actually Babylonia, Babel. And there's a very decisive moment in, in world history, so in Jewish history, 605, where the Babylonians defeat the Egyptians and the Assyrians. The Babylonians take over the world, basically, the Bufanetza. And that's very important because in the course of the book, uh, the book is not always in exactly in chronological order, but in the course of the book, the Jews in Israel are trying to figure out how they can function in light of the fact you have these three superpowers a one initially it's Ashur to the north and Mitzrayim south, of course. And then the Babylonians take over. How do you respond to the Babylonians? Maybe you, you should support the Egyptians and the Assyrians to counteract them. And that's part of what's going on in terms of the book. 
Yirmiyahu is very consistent throughout the book. He doesn't love the Babylonians. At the end of the book, he has some terrible prophecies about them. But he understands the reality. His understanding of the reality is that the Babylonians are going to succeed and you can't fight them. Don't attempt to fight them. Live with them in some way and, and, and you'll be able to, to, to function. That's his view. Counter to that, and this is a very important point for the book, many people are saying quite the opposite. The many people that are saying it are not just the politicians, but the, but the other prophets. In the book of Yemio, there's an enormous conflict between one set of prophets who speak presumably in God's name, whether they believe God is actually saying this or not is a good question, and Yemio is on the other side. And this creates for Yemio great, great difficulties. First of all, he's delivering a message nobody wants to hear. Mm-hmm. And second of all, on the other side, there are prophets, so-called prophets, who are delivering exactly the opposite message. So one of the themes that runs through the book, we'll encounter this several times, is first of all, how do you know who's, who was the real prophet? But second of all, because he delivers an unfortunate message as far as the people are concerned, there are attempts to imprison him and there are attempts also to, uh, to uh, kill him. On more than one occasion in this book, explicitly, his, his life is, is in great danger. He's saved on more than one occasion by somebody, and that's, the, that's a big piece of the book how the politicians, how the prophets, how the people, how the priests respond to Yirmiyo. It's one of the very important features of, of the book. Okay, so I wanted just to put it out there. One last point about studying Yirmiyo as a prophet, we will have occasion to look at other prophecies. Because the idea of prophecy doesn't begin with, 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 with Yirmiyo. The idea of prophecy and prophets begins with Moshe. Moshe himself in the Chumash is to told to go to the center of the camp and um, to gather 70 people to the center and I will place your spirit upon them and they will prophesy, whatever that means. And Moshe's counterpart, Shmuel, character based on Moshe, we know that once Shmuel becomes a prophet in the third chapter of Shmuel, there are these other prophets out there. Samuel said to Saul, when you leave me, you will meet a band of prophets. So the idea of prophecy, bands of prophets, groups of prophets, is one that we find both in the Chumash and the Book of Shmuel. Why do you start there rather than start with the patriarchs? I started with the patriarchs before you walked in. He <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you're, you're raising actually a different question with what does it mean to be a prophet? Is a prophet simply anybody who is, who is communicating with God? Or is a prophet somebody who has a particular message? And by the way, I want to make one last point, and we'll jump into Yermio, and that is what the Talmud says about prophets. The Talmud presumes there are millions of prophets out there. It doesn't assume these are the only prophets we have. But the Talmud says there are many, many prophets, and maybe many real prophets too, not just fake, but real prophets. So why does one prophecy become part of our Bible and one prophecy does not? So the Talmud says a prophecy that has relevance for the future is a prophecy that that is written down. And a prophecy that was just for its particular time and has no relevance for the future is a true prophecy, but not one that is is written down. In that spirit, I think we can ask ourselves the question as we study about relevance over here, because presumably that's why it's here. It's not just about the Babylonians. There's something in this book, that's, that's the claim that the rabbinic tradition makes, that these prophecies do have relevance for all time. They may not have relevance in the sense that the Torah has relevance in terms of, of one's practice, of one's, the way one works in the world, the way one uh, mitzvot and those kind of things. Then the rabbinic tradition assumes that mitzvot are the province only of the Torah. But the lessons of the prophets and the teachings of the prophets and the moral teachings presumably have relevance for all time. That's why we study the Book of Yemiyo. Okay, so that's just a very brief introduction. These are things that we will encounter over and over again. And it is very striking that the very first verse, the very year miyo ben chukiyo, mina koadim asher ba'anotot v'yeretz ben yamin. So he's from the priest asher ba'anotot. We are familiar with anotot, actually. Why? Actually, we're familiar with anotot today. Actually, you go to Israel, you can go to anotot. And it's not uh, sort of a not too far from, from Jerusalem. Um, 
from traveling to Ramallah, I think you might go, you know, you can go to the Jordan through there. It's in fact, it's close. But Anatot is found already in the Bible before Jeremiah. Where is Anatot found? Who knows? They were running away from Saul and Saul massacred No, that's no. That's not Anatot. How about the vineyard? That's not vote. No, no, not around. You run you're close, actually. Anatot is a city of priests. And it's found in the book of Shmuel, actually. Actually, the beginning of Malachim, when, when Solomon takes over the throne and he kills the Yoav and he kills Shimei and he kills his brother, whatever. And then he has a priest. The priest was from the city of No, city that saw massacre. That's the city of priests. But there's another city called Anatot. And Shlomo says to Eviatar, the priest, I'm not going to kill you because you suffered with my father, etc. But Anatot, go to Anatot. Go run to Anatot. Anatot is a city of priests. And by the way, it's very interesting. I just discovered this recently when I was in Israel, that apparently, and I don't think it's limited just to this particular case, but in, for example, Morocco, many, many, many years ago, there were cities for, of priests, actually. Just priests. They were all Kohanim in the city. The, the Talmud speaks about the city of priests. What do you do with Birkat uh, Kohanim? Ir, ir Shakur Kohanim. That is not just a theoretical question, apparently. Apparently, there were actually cities of priests. So, Anatot, we know from uh, the story of, of Eviatar, he's told to go to Anatot, to run to Anatot, which is the city of priests. And Yermio is from the Kohanim Asher Banatot. And this is actually important to us not just from a historical standpoint, but in terms of the book, because he's a fellow that many people would be very happy to, uh, to uh, get rid of. And one of the groups that's happy to get rid of him are the other priests. The people in his own hometown want to actually kill him. They don't like what he's teaching. So we will encounter this in terms of Yermiel being a Kohen, both in terms of the other Kohanim, but also in terms of what he says at the prophecies. Because the Kohanim in, in, in certain traditions, both in the book of Devarim and elsewhere, are the teachers of Torah. They're the judges, teachers of Torah, etc. And we will see that in the book of Yermio, there are many references to kind of halachic sections of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the Torah. So we'll get to all these things. There are many other interesting features to the book. By the way, yes. Book. yes, he was, right? Yes. Cohen, yes. Yeah. And I obviously I'm thinking who wrote the book. So I, I assume that if it's not Yermiao himself, right. so it's a, some scribes or school of scribes or whatever. So the, the well, that's a very important point, which we'll get to. Go ahead, yeah. So the people, people in Israel weren't producing such a book. Right. And I, I don't think that we were people in Egypt either. Right. So we come back to the Great Babylonia. Could so be possible. Babylonian book. So this is also like Yecheskel. Because, um, there's something Yecheskel. else though that you touched on, which is, we'll get to it, not now, but very important point. In the, what's exceptional in the case of Yermio, we have this no other place actually. We know that Yermio has a scribe. We know from the book that he has a disciple who writes down his prophecies. His name is Baruch. Baruch ben Neria, and that he's very interesting. I mean, I can't, I don't want to touch on everything right now, his coming attractions, but he is a, he, there aren't that many situations in the, in the Bible of somebody who has a, uh, a, a disciple. Of course, Moshe has a disciple, Yoshua, and we all has a disciple, Elisha. And the third person that, and Elisha has a disciple, Gehazi, who turns out to be a, not a good disciple, but the, Yermio has a disciple. And we know actually that Baruch is writing down the prophecies because we have a very important story that whenever we get to it, Yemio can't actually leave. Yemio is, is put in prison. He spends a lot of his time in prison and pits and everything. And he dictates to Baruch. He dictates prophecies. What the prophecies are is a very good question. Are they the old prophecies, new prophecies? He dictates to Baruch to write them down. Baruch writes them down, and Baruch goes to the to the to the king and to the princes of the princes, etc. And he reads to them what Yirmiyo said. Well, what is this? No, he says Yirmiyo said it. And I, I wrote everything down. So we know actually that unlike any other prophet that we know of, 
he actually has a scribe. The scribe is also a disciple, and Baruch is an important character in the book that we'll hopefully get to and touch upon. But these are all interesting things for the future. So they I let want, Baruch visit him in jail? Yes, but he's probably standing outside the jail, and if he went into the jail. Sounds like he's standing outside and Yermio is dictating to him. And then, of course, the famous story, after he, after he brings it to different people, the king burns, he burns it. And then he, and he, and he, he goes back and Yermio says, I'm going to write more. And then I want, I'll, I'll write a, he burned part of it, but we're going to write even more things. The guy has guts. I mean, it's just unbelievable, you know? Now, it is, he is, now we have the uh, choosing of Yermio as a prophet, which is our topic this morning. And it begins in verse number four. It's one of the haftarot that we read before, before Tisha B'Av. There are three haftarot we read before Tisha B'Av, Shosha the Puranita, which are about destruction and etc. Two of them are from Jeremiah, the first two chapters, and then the third, is, of course, is Chazon, is the beginning of, beginning of Yishayel. So it's the beginnings of the book. The beginning of Yermio and the beginning of Yishayel are the prophecies that are read before Tisha B'Av. After Tisha B'Av, the, all the after of conservation were from Yishayel, Shiva de Nechemda, or from Isaiah, beginning in chapter 40, but the conservation, but the after of before. So let's begin now with this, uh, with verse number four. So it's Matos, if, if you have the art scroll, it's on 1192. 1192, okay. So we have, fortunately, they, they've chosen it as a half Torah. So, so that we could all have access to the text. That's why it was actually chosen as half Torah. Okay, Eli is the Jeremiah. It's put in, he's speaking. The word of God came to me. It's interesting that the book begins with the word Divrei. Divrei Yemiyo ben Chilkiyahu. And then verse number two, Ashaya Devar Hashem Elav. The word of God came to him. And now in verse number four, Vahi Devar Hashem Elai Leymar. V'terem et Sacham Yipabeten Yidaticha. V'terem Teitzei Meirechem Hiktashticha. Navi Lagoyim Nitaticha. So the, the verse says, before you were created, for actually I created you, I knew you, and they translate, I selected you, which is probably a good translation. Yidativ sometimes means to select. You have with Abraham. That I know him so much as I have selected him. So I selected you, says God to Yermio, before you were formed. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Consecrate means to set something aside for a holy purpose. And you were consecrated even before you were born. I have made you a prophet unto the nations. Now what, first of all, before we get to the other examples in the Bible of somebody being chosen by God, there are several. What does it mean, I made you in a, a prophet to the nations? And the truth is that most of Jeremiah's prophecies are to Israel, most of them. However, not all of them. This is actually a very interesting point about prophets in general. And that is, say, the big prophets, Yeshayahu, Yermio, and Yechezkel, the big three, all of them have sections in their book which are specifically prophecies about the nation. Maybe later on in our studies, we'll take a look at these and see where they appear within the book, which is also very interesting. So the prophet is not just the prophet who speaks to Israel. You could say goyim, it's not impossible to translate goyim, nations, perhaps means tribes. You could if you wish to say that. But in point of fact, the great prophets and even some of the minor prophets have prophecies which relate to the nations. I always thought about this as something very interesting because when we think about the great prophets, the greatest prophet, Moshe, he certainly doesn't prophesy about the nations. He may speak to Pharaoh, but there's no prophecy about the nations. In point of fact, there is only one prophet in the Torah who prophesies about the nations. Bilaam. Now, Bilaam is actually very interesting because Bilaam is the only prophet we have when the Talmud speaks or some statements are made about Bilaam being Moshe's equal, and of course, the 
all the medievals try to poo-poo that. But in point of fact, I don't think we should dismiss that so easily. Because you talk about a prophet, and you think about a prophet, you know, and the great prophets, they're not just speaking to Israel. And the only example we have of somebody who speaks about sort of globally to, to the world is Bilam. After Bilam is fired from his job, uh, he says, he, you know, I, Bullock says to him, I thought you would do a good job, and I see it's very disappointing. You're fired. And Bilam says, okay, that's fine. But before I go, he says, let me tell you one more prophecy. This one's, this one's on the house, he says. You know, debating right. for this one. <laughs> What's going to happen to your people at the end of days? He talks about Moab, talks about Edom, talks about Amor, talks about Keni, et cetera, et cetera. So there you have a Navi Goyim, actually. So Navi Goyim is interesting because uh, the plain reading of it would be a prophet unto the world. And it's true that the prophets are not only speaking to Israel, although primarily to Israel, obviously. But now let's get back to the beginning of the verse, which is important. I chose you before you were born. God says to Yirmiyahu, even before you were formed, So we have this, uh, one might say calling, Yirmiyahu is being told in effect that he's been chosen for this particular task. His response, Omar, I said, when I was told this by God, Hashem Elohim. It's Adonai and Yud Hey Vav Hey, and that's a, a name of God that appears many times in Yirmiyot. It appears many times in Yeshayo and many many times in Yechesko. That particular name of God, Hashem Elohim. It doesn't appear very often in the Torah, actually, but it appears here. Maybe again we will think about that down the road. Woe unto me, aha, ah, they translate ah, aha, ah. I don't, I can't speak. I'm a young person. A nar can be a, a nar means a young person. It could be a, sometimes nar means a child, actually. Sometimes nar could mean a teenager or something like that. Uh, the Akeda Yitzhak is called a nar. And the plain reading of it is that he's not 37 years old. He's also not three years old. He's probably, you know, 15, 14, 17, 18. He said, no. Nah. Yosef, uh, Yosef is nah. a nar. And Moshe is called a nar. He named nar boche, and he's, a, he's an infant. So the word nar covers a range of possibilities. And it could even, probably a nar means more than a particular age, somebody who has not achieved, attained the kind of maturity. Someone who's still developing. So it could be any range of development. Right. In the case of Moshe, it's even before that. Pharaoh's daughters by the river. He's a child. He's not weaned. He's not nursed yet. Now, the, the commentaries are interested in that, nar boche, but it doesn't matter. The point is, what it means for our purposes is, he says, I can't do what you tell me to do because I have no training. I have no experience. This is not a calling for me. I think you have the wrong guy, basically. I can't speak. And God responds, Don't say you're a nar. You will go wherever I send you. You will speak what I tell you to speak. So we have an interesting conversation here where God says, this is your task. And the person says, I can't do the task because I can't speak. And God says, don't worry about that. Right. So the obvious, what jumps to mind is the story of Moshe. So the story, the, the, the calling, the choosing of Moshe jumps to mind. God says, this is your task. And Moshe says, I can't do the task. Among other things, he says, I'm not a talker, right? He says, Kvad Peu. And it sounds like not just not a talker, but he has some kind of problem in speech. Whatever kvad peu kvad was shown. It could be that he has this tr trouble speaking, maybe he stutters, who knows? Or maybe he doesn't pronounce the words well. Uh, but these, these are two very similar situations. Now, because they're two similar situations, we, of course, have to make distinctions between the two of them. 
And there are very important distinctions between the two stories. Although they're similar, clearly, this, this idea that someone is chosen for a job and says, I'm not the right person, we first encounter with Moshe. And we have several other examples as well. This is one of them. However, I think it's important to think about the differences between the two, two stories. Um, somebody here want to suggest this differences? There are actually many differences between the two. Yes, what do you want to say? Well, here he's really blaming the problem of words on his age. Moshe doesn't do that. Right, he doesn't that is say true. Because I'm young, he just that's says, right. I can't speak. That's well. an important difference. Moshe actually says, "I can't talk." Here sounds like, listen, you know, give me come come back in ten years. You know what I mean? Hopefully, you get somebody else in the interim. But uh, <laughs> I mean, yes, we're clear about Moshe's background and you know, from the palace, etc. And just more about but, that. Oh, that but, 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 Yirmiyahu, you said two things. We are clear about Moshe's background is very important. There is no palace. Forget palace. That's for the movies. <laughs> and then the, we don't know where he is. He's if Pharaoh's daughter adopts him. Maybe she lives in the palace. Maybe she lives uh, off the grid. What, what, we don't know where she lives, right? But there's no sense in the story. There is true that later when Moshe wants to speak to Pharaoh, he gets an audience. That is true. But there's no sense in the story of Moshe on any level that he and Pharaoh have some kind of close relationship. That's not true. But, but your first point's very important. Um, right. So let's, 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 let's think about that for a moment. In the case of Moshe, actually, we know why God is choosing Moshe. We know why. Because Moshe has a history. His history is very clear. The choosing of Moshe is chapter 3, the burning bush. But we have chapter two before we have chapter three. And we know from chapter two, three things about Moshe, which are one. There's three separate stories about him. He actually gets involved, right? In the first instance, he sees the Egyptian beating the Jew. He looks around. There's nobody else. Either no one is around or nobody cares or whatever. And he steps in and he hits, he kills the Egyptian, actually. So he steps in and he could have stood aside. He could have said, it's not, it's not my problem. But he chooses to get involved in that dispute between the Egyptian and the Jew. That's the first story. And the next day he goes out and two Jews are fighting. And then he gets involved as well. And he intervenes between the two Jews. He doesn't hit anybody, but he says, what, what is this? Why are you, why are you hitting your, 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 your friend? What, what, what is this? And the response, of course, is, who asked you, you know? Were you going to kill us when you killed the Egyptian? You know? And Moshe realizes that the matter is known. Whether they inform on him or they just talk about it and people know about it. Uh, in any event, he runs away. He runs off to Midian. And when he gets to Midian, he comes to a well. And there he sees that a bunch of uh, women, or maybe the girls, women, I don't know, but women certainly, females, and they are waiting for uh, to, to take, get water, and the uh, shepherds are pushing them aside, right? By Yaakov Moshe, by Yoshian, and Moshe arose and he saves them and he, and he, and he waters the flock. And that's a situation where, first of all, he himself, it's an amazing story actually. He's already been burned by, by, through his intervention. He had to run away from home, he had to flee for his life. You would think he would have learned the lesson not to get involved. He doesn't learn that lesson, and here, has nothing to do with him at all. It's a, it's a bunch of Midianites fighting with other Midianites or whatever. Nonetheless, and the two non-Jews. The first case is Jew and non-Jew. Second, two Jews, two non-Jews. And in each case, he gets involved. And the language is very striking. Vayaka Moshe Vayoshian. Hoshia, right? It's exactly the word that the Torah uses for God saving us, taking us out of Mitzrayim. Vayosha Hashem Vayomahu. So we know, actually, why... God chooses Moshe. He has credentials. Um, it's not just happening. I didn't choose you before you were born necessarily. Looking at the world and seeing, I need someone to represent me in, 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 in the struggle. What better person to represent me in the struggle that has already, first of all, taken a stand against slavery by killing the Egyptian. In effect, he's taken a stand against slavery. And second of all, person who has a real sense of, 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 of right and wrong, defending the weak from the strong, which of course is the story of, of the slaves. I want someone who's going to defend the interests of the slaves against Mitzrayim. 
So in that particular case, we understand very well why God is choosing Moshe. Now, Moshe doesn't want to do it. It's another story. But in the case over here, there's no reason we can discern as to why he would have been chosen prior to his birth. It sounds like prior to his conception, even. You're someone that I already have singled out in time way before. So there's a very big difference between the two of them. Is it, there's, oh, any other differences between the two? Yes. Yeah, I was to say, that in that respect, it reminds us of Abraham, that we don't know why God says to Abraham left the farm. Right, that's true. There's no explicit reason. No explicit reason is given. That is true. I mean, we can say things, but what else? What, 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 what is another distinction between the two stories? Very important distinction. Moshe between Moshe has, what? Moshe has Aaron. Moshe does have Aaron, right, and, and Yubio has Baruch. But Moshe doesn't have Aaron at that point. I actually touched on a very important point. When God says to Moshe, I want you to go down to Mitzrayim. And Moshe says, who am I to do this? Who knows? I mean, you know, nobody. I can't confirm. And God's answer to Moshe, before he gets to not speaking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. There's no mention of Aaron in the story. In fact, I would argue that when God, Moshe says to God, I can't speak. I'm not a, I'm not a talker. And so they get somebody else. And God says to Moshe, who has, who has created speech, if not me, right? Right? And now go. And then Moshe says to God, please, when do you get somebody else? And then God says to Moshe, in chapter three, your brother Aaron, your dati ki daber daber hu. I know he can talk. And the question actually is, what do you make of God's speech? To, when God says to Moshe, in that chapter, I know he can talk. I'll tell you what my take on it is. My take on it is, Moshe, if I wanted a talker, would I come to you in the first place? I don't want a talker. I want a doer. I don't want talkers. Plenty of talkers out there. I'm not interested in a talker. You're worried about what you're going to say. I have created speech. So don't worry about the talking. And Moshe says, you know what? After all his excuses, when, when, when do you get somebody else? Which is very interesting because it means the real reason is something else. The real reason is not because he can't talk, not they're not going to believe me. There's some other deep reason here that he doesn't want to go. And when God says to Moshe, okay, take Aaron with you, that's a concession on God's part. Your dati ki who I know he can certainly talk, I think is a, is a critique, actually. Now, I think that the question of Moshe and Aaron is an interesting question, because whereas I do believe that in the initial uh, encounter, God doesn't want Aaron. God only wants Moshe, and God says why. I'll be with you. Um, it's what God says to Jeremiah too, as we'll see. And Moshe has a million complaints, and you know what it is? Moshe is the only person that God can choose. There is no other candidate for this job. And since there's no other candidate for the job, Moshe is in a very good negotiating position. And he manages to extract, extract from God two big concessions. One is to get someone to help him, his brother. And the second is to be provided with these miracles to perform in, in Egypt. But the sense you get, I think, is that initially God doesn't want miracles. God doesn't want Aaron. Go in faith. Go with me. And together we'll be able to you represent me. So, yeah. So that is a difference. At the end of the day, Moshe does have Aaron. Yermio has his disciple. He has Baruch ben Neria. There's another important distinction here, though. Very important point. A difference between Moshe and, and the Yermio, which is why I believe that the better, the, the, the more significant parallel is not Moshe, actually. It is parallel. Oh, I mean, yes. Could it be the Samuel parallel? The one where um, Samuel hasn't done anything yet either? Maybe it's even on the merit of his mother that he is, but really it's just the merit of being born. Um, uh, that that is enough for him to be called by God when he's still young. Uh, and well, the Samuel parallel is important. The Samuel parallel, the story of Samuel's choosing, which is chapter three, is based on the story of Moshe. It's based on the snare, actually. We maybe we'll go there, but that's. I'm, I'm asking a different question. I'm asking what is the difference between what God says to Yirmiyahu and what God says to Moshe? Yeah. Do we know whether Moshe was? Um, no, he doesn't say that at all. We don't, nothing of the sort. So yes, it's true. Let me, just, let me just say that. It never says that explicitly. What, what, it, what it says is, it describes his life. 
what, what he has done, those three situations, uh, and then God approaches Moshe afterwards. Now, it is true, by the way, it is true that the birth of Moshe is singled out in the Chumash as something very significant. That is true. And that's sort of like, right, Vatera Otoki Tovu, that she's that the mother saw that he was tov, in which Rashi interprets the house was filled with light. Rashi says, What do you mean? What mother thinks the kid is not tov? You know what I mean? <laughs> at least at that point, anyway. The point is, the point is that the kitov is a term from kitov is from the beginning of the Torah. The first creation was light. So there's something about the birth of this particular child which is a, which connects us to the creation story because, after all, the book of Exodus. Is about creation. It's about creation of a nation. A nation is born, and that this person, Moshe, will be instrumental in the birth of the nation, that's for sure. But the idea that he was called at that point in any sense, that doesn't appear. It only appears with Yermiel. I called you before you were even created. I had you in mind. Um, there's another point over here. Yes. Well, it's, it's actually, uh, obviously, it's not that point you have in mind. Forget my point. What do exactly. you have in mind? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but but it, it seems at least implicit, if not explicit, that that, uh, that God says to to uh, Jeremiah, um, "I have made you to do this <coughs> to fulfill this mission." Right. That is true. That's a very important. I, 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 I will come back to that point. That is that is true. That's a very important point. I'll get back there. And another point, and it's a very simple point, right? Maybe what is? The mission itself. Right. Different. What is the difference? That's the point I want to get to. I, I it's a different more, mission, actually. Is more in my eyes, like the political leader. That's right. That's a very, very important point. It's not the same thing. Moshe is, is a prophet. He's a great prophet. But actually, when you look at the Chumash, and this is, it's very interesting. What is Moshe in the Torah? You know, when you, it depends what text you're reading. When you read the Talmud of, of other rabbinic texts, you get a sense that Moshe basically is spending his whole time studying teaching Torah. That's what he does. But in point of fact, when you read the Chumash, it's a very different situation. His main role, his name is Moshe, okay? Which means the one who takes us out, the one who draws out. His task is to get us out of Mitzrayim. Now, it's true, not just physically out, but spiritually out. And his task is to prepare us to enter the land. So he is a great teacher. And he brings down God's teaching, that's for sure. But he's also a, a kind of political leader. Moshe is, an, Moshe, is a, Moshe is a political leader. Moshe has to deal with the different factions. Moshe has to organize the nation. All kinds of things. Some he does better, some he does less well. But in point of fact, he's not just a prophet. In the case of Yermio, that's, that's, not, that's not so. Yermio has only one role over here. He, he's not political in any sense. He, he t takes political positions, but he's in no, he's not capable of making those decisions. He can, he can tell the king what the king should do, but the king doesn't have to listen to him. And in point of fact, doesn't listen to him. Kings, I would say, it's not just one king. Um, so that's very, very different. Yermio is playing a prophet. And God says to Yermio, I'm going to put my word in your mouth. I'm going to tell you what to say. That's your, that's your mission. You're a very pure prophet. And Moshe is much more complex because Moshe's task is to, uh, is to lead. In fact, one might say that in the story of Moshe, in contrast to Yermio, remember when Moshe goes, finally after the whole negotiation, and Moshe, uh, <coughs> you know, Moshe's, uh, God says to Moshe, etamateh zetikach biyadecha, take your staff with you with which you will perform miracles the staff in the Torah represents leadership right the, the staff the rod should not depart from Judah Mater is a symbol of one's leadership one's one position in society and Moshe is chosen to be a leader now there are many problems with that the main one being the people already have leaders they have Shotrim, they have Zikanim. This guy wakes up one morning, I am your leader. You know what I mean? Self-proclaimed leader. It wasn't self-proclaimed, but as far as the others are concerned, who asked you, you know? And not only that, ever since you showed up, things are worse. So, but Moshe is fundamentally a, a, a leader, also a prophet. Yermio is a prophet. A 
prophet to the nations, a prophet to Israel, a prophet to the kings, etc. There, that's a very big difference between so, so the two are very different, actually. Having said that, there is something they have in common, which is that they have been chosen, chosen by God to do God's work. The work may be different, but God is choosing Yirmiyo. It's not up to you. It's not up to you, Yirmiyo. Don't tell me you're unworthy, because you're a nar. Forget a nar. I chose you before you were conceived, so don't worry about nar. I chose you in the womb. I chose you before. So that's a very important point. Uh, distinction between the two of them. Go ahead. Okay, I think usually he both speaks speaks in poetical language. Yeah. And I think that's when you're quoting the Bible correctly, if I'm wrong, it's usually human poetry. But here, like your meow. Um, Sighting, sighting, yes. 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 Which suggests maybe that it's, it's the whole story is written in first person. Right. Uh, unlike the Moshe story, of course. Right. So there is some uh, transformation from God's speech to the speech of the human being. Right. It's poetry, actually. True. And it, it's interesting to say that. He's already, right? He's already, the book is already citing God's speech. And the, of course, the, 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 the prophet is delivering God's message. I don't think we should assume that the message that the prophet is delivering is actually citing God. I think the assumption is that the prophet is citing God's message, but cites God's message in God's own word, in, in the prophet's own words. And certainly the Different prophets have different styles of writing. Isaiah is not Yermio, and 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 Yechesku is very different. So each one is, I mean, you, the, the the larger question would be: to what extent is prophecy simply something you simply saying what God tells you, and to what extent is prophecy a function of the person? Me, the person, given who I am, everything gets filtered through the person. I'm, I'm much more uh, leaning towards the second option that it's, it's, it's very human in a sense. And that also leaves room for discussion about false prophets. Is a false prophet simply someone who says, God, they think God, they make up something. God said, worship idols tomorrow. They know God never said that, but they're making it up. Or is it possible that the false prophet, given who the prophet is basically, is actually hearing something, but misinterpreting given where they themselves stand. I think that's an interesting possibility. In any event, these are all big questions that we will get to. I wanted to, since Sandra mentioned Shmuel, which is another example of one who's chosen early on, and Shmuel is called a Nar also, chapter three, Van Nar Shmuel. So they are true. They are the choosing of Shmuel, which is based on the choosing of Moshe, which is based on the snare. Um, we don't know what he's, he actually hasn't done anything yet. On the other hand, in the case of Shmuel, I would say unlike Moshe. Moshe, we know what Moshe did. His behavior is, what is, is such that he's a good candidate for taking Israel out of Egypt. In the case of Shmuel, he doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Chapter three, right? The little boy Samuel served God before Eli. That is true. He hasn't done anything, but we know something else about Shmuel, which is he's been set up to do this by his mother, who actually trains him. In other words, the training of, now it's true that Moshe was also, in a sense, trained or given an identity by his mother. Because that's the whole point of taking Moshe from the side of the river and bringing him back to his mother who, uh, who nurses him. And Shmuel is the same. But in the case of Chana, one's get a, one, one gets a sense we don't know much about Moshe's mother except for the fact she's Jewish. But in the case of Hannah, we know plenty about Hannah and that she is a, 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 a very significant religious figure who has a certain conception of, of the way the world should be and basically is dedicating her son to try to carry out God's will as she understands it. So I would say in the case of the Samuel, Moshe. what? It's the same about Moshe, that Moshe's mother, that we know that, she, that she's a Jewess. We know that she's a Levite. He's a Levite, right? But we don't know what that implies. Even that 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 is true. We don't know precisely what that implies. Um, 
We know what the Levites are in the book of Genesis, which is not so good, but we don't uh, know that at this point. But it's not Chana in any event. The Chana is very different. In Chana, we know clearly this child is dedicated to God to carry out God's work as Chana understands it. And she makes it very clear what God's work is. God's work is a, 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 a perfected world, a world in which the arrogant and the powerful are not beating up on the, on the, on the meek and, and, and the humble, as she says in her prayer. And then she gives her child over, and the child is serving God before Eli. So the point is, there we know something about Shmuel, which is he's being set up for this purpose before God speaks to him. Now, it's true that he never spoke to God. God never spoke to him. He doesn't know what it is. He has to be trained. How to hear the message? He is trained by Eli, actually trains him. Eli tells him what to say. It's very powerful. But yeah, so there is, I would say Shmuel is not exactly the same as Moshe in terms of birth. Different. In the case of Moshe, though, it's his behavior. In the case of Shmuel, he's received a certain training. There's a certain trajectory that he's on. In the case of Yirmiyo, there's nothing. He's chosen before he's born, and that's very different. So I think the so we have, we have Moshe, we have Shmuel, we have Yirmiyo. What other stories do we have of somebody who is being called by God? And there's some, in, in one case, there's some kind of... Samson. Samson. I'll get to Samson later. Samson, I think, is critical. But if that's, that's my chidush, actually. But we'll, we'll get there. But there's somebody else before you get to Samson. Is another great prophet. Isaiah. Isaiah. It's also a Torah, by the way. You're very lucky. We have Torah. I think it's after of Kitisa, no? Chapter six of Isaiah. Wait, 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 wait. Was that? Is it Kitisa? Like total coincidence, but what is after of Kitisa? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Kitisa is Malachim Aleph Yudchet. No, it's not. Aleph Tzalamit. No, it's not. No. Wait, 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 let me let me take a look so I can find this. That's not what I'm looking for. Hold on. Let's see if I can find this up. Oh, right. No, you're right. That's not, not right. Which, which one are you looking for? I'm looking for chapter six of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter six. Here it is. Yitro. Yitro. Ten Commandments. Yitro. In, this, in the art school, 1154. 1154. Chapter six of Isaiah. This is chapter 6, right? After the death of Uziyahu, so Isaiah says, he describes what he sees, his prophecy. He sees God uh, sitting on a throne. He sees God on the throne. And surrounded by by Srafim, right? Srafim on Dimi Maolo. They have six uh, six wings, six wings, right? Very famous after actually. The Karaz Zel Zevi Omar. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Hashem Tzvaot Mulochar, it's Kodo. The same Kadusha, right? They're crying out, Kadosh, Kadosh. Each, each to the other. Kadusha is responsive. That's what Kadusha is. It's a responsive phrase, right? And the, uh, the houses, the doorposts are shaking. And the house became filled with smoke. Right? Vomar, and I said, Yeshaya, to the prophet, Oyli ki nidmeti, ki ish tamei svatayim anochi, uvetocham tamei svatayim anochi yosheim, ki eta melech Hashem tzvaot ro'u enai. Isaiah says, woe to me, I will certainly die. I am a man of unclean lips who dwells amongst a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the master of legions. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. His hand was a coal. He took it with tongs from atop the altar. This is the heavenly temple. So it is an altar and there's coals on the altar. And the angel, the seraph, takes a coal by Yaga Alpi, he touched my mouth. By Yomer, he named a Gaza al Svatecha, the Saravonecha, the Khatratra to Kupar. 
So he touches his mouth with a comb. So I have removed your sin. I've purified you. Vomar, Vashmat call Hashem Omer, that I heard God's voice. At me Eshrach, who shall we? Who shall I send? Who will represent us? Vaomar, and I said, I said, send me. etc. Bring this prophecy to the people, right? And they're not going to listen to you until how long? Until destruction, etc. But a tent will remain. That's the Haftorah. Very famous Haftorah. And it's chosen, that story is chosen to be a part of our liturgy. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. That's it. But there you have a situation where it's interesting. It's similar to Year Me All, different. They're all different. But you have a situation where the, per, where the prophet, right? By the way, it's not the first chapter of the book. It's chapter six. He's already prophesying earlier. Prophesies Hazon is the first chapter of you. But in chapter six, he has this image, this vision, and he feels that he will die. He see these, he's unworthy of, of seeing of seeing God, unworthy of, of, of being God's presence in this sense. And he thinks he's gonna die. And then the angel touches his mouth with a coal and he says, I purified you. And now you can prophesy. That's very striking, actually. So, uh, whether the call is the, the Medrash says because he said the people are unclean, and the Medrash God didn't like that. He can say you're unclean. But in any event, there's something about the story over here, which is very similar to the story of uh, Yirmiyahu. <clears throat> and in fact, this idea that I have placed God's word in your mouth. The word is in your mouth, right? Well, what's the name of Yermio? Yermio, it says... And where's that verse? Ten. Yes, that's the verse I'm looking for. Next verse, verse 9, right. Vayishlach Hashem et Yodo vayaga alpi vayomer Hashem elai inei notati devarai pefiko. So in each of those two stories, the, the, the choosing of Yishayahu He's already been chosen before, but the second choosing of Yeshayahu to deliver this particular message and other messages, in each of the two stories, you have God, in this case, God or the angel, touching his mouth. In the case of Yemio, I have placed my words in your mouth. So you are, you are simply, do, you deliver my message. And you, play, and you deliver my message. So don't worry about, you can't speak. Because the message is, I'm putting the message in your mouth. In the case of Yeshayahu, it's similar. I touch, he touches the mouth of Yeshayahu, but there it sounds like it's not just about putting the words in his mouth. There it sounds like something is happening to Yeshayahu, which makes him either make, makes him worthy or dispels his fears or his um, inhibitions to, to prophesy. How can I do this? How can I deliver the message? Who am I to deliver God's message of the Holy God, and et cetera, et cetera? And no, I, I purify you. I make you worthy of standing in my presence. I make you worthy of delivering the message. So there is a sense of the message in each case, but it strikes me that the two stories are very different. And one of them, one difference is that in the case over here, he's never prophesied before. In the case of Yeshayel, chapter six, he's already a prophet. But apparently this is, is an additional aspect to it, which requires some kind of initiation. That's a good word, initiation, which is what you have in the two cases. So we have Moshe, we have Shmuel, we have Yishayo, uh, we have Yemiyo, right? And now we have, now let's get to Shimshon, yes. Okay, so, no, so Rosie was mentioning that Midrash about Moshe being touched on the lip. The yes, 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 right, true. So that's a good, good point. That yes. That kind of reverse engineered yes, from yes, yes, stories. that's a very good point. Yes. The, the, Medrash, the famous measures that Moshe is in Pharaoh's court, whatever, and that is, I think there's more than one version of the Medrash. He's supposed God to choose. Right. And he burns his mouth. Right, exactly. So that is probably the case. It's probably reading back into the story of Moshe. When he says, when you I have lost the, the time, I know, they say that. What? When he 
he says, Kfad Pel Kralashon, though, he they say that's because of the cold. Right, exactly. His mouth. That's right. There, it's funny. There, the cold is what, in the case of Moshe, sort of makes it difficult for him to prophesy. Mm-hmm. In the case of Yeshayo, it's what allows him to prophesy. Mm-hmm. So it's also actually. like a stage of older, like young. And right. then here, it's purifying to something of age, very interesting. Right, in the case of, in the case of, um, Right, you have this actually in many uh, cases, very interesting, where a medrash will read in a later story to an earlier story. I'll give you another example of it. We studied this and we studied Shoftim. Uh, the story of Gidon. Gidon is afraid, actually, and God chooses Gidon. There's another case of choosing somebody who says, I, I, I'm, I'm not worthy of it. What are you choosing me for? And God, there's a kind of initiation right that Gideon has to go through. And part of it is to go to his father's house. Father has a lot of idols. And to break all the idols of his father. Now, of course, the Chumash never says a word about Abraham breaking any idols. It's not in the Torah at all. But the story of Abraham breaking his father's idols is taken directly from Gideon. It's a reading back into the Abraham story, what you have in the case of Gideon, and it's interesting on two levels. First of all, when you look at it, you realize that several other pieces of language of the Gidon story are appropriate for Abraham. It's kind of parallel language. And then you wonder, what is the Medrash trying to do? I mean, part of it is what I think Suri said earlier, that the Chumash tells us nothing about Abraham's early life. You encounter him, he's 75 years old. So, and the Medrash is interested in trying to figure out why is this man worthy of being the founder of the nation, of being the Avram, the great father, etc. That's, that's a very important and interesting point about these, how these texts interact with each other and the Midrashim reading back into an earlier text what we encounter in the later text. And I believe it's typically done when it sees more than one linguistic connection. I don't think it's done randomly. I think there's something about it that it picks up on and it then reads back. I wanted to get to the other initiation story, which I think is actually very relevant to uh, Yirmiyahu, and that's the story of Shimshon. Because the story of Shimshon, actually, is a story where somebody is chosen before he's born. Someone is chosen before he's born. And in the case of Shimshon, of course, the angel comes to Shimshon's mother, right? right? and tell Shimshon's mother that she shouldn't drink any wine and don't eat anything impure because your son will, will be a, 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 a Nazarite and he will, he will begin to save Israel. He'll be the redeemer of Israel. And there it's interesting that the angel speaks not to Shimshon himself actually, <coughs> very hard to know in general, I'm actually about to teach them show on Sunday mornings, but it's very hard to know because the text never tells us to what extent Shimshon understands his own mission. I and mean, it's not explicit. We are at, the angel never talks to Shimshon. The angel talks to Shimshon's mother, actually. Yeah. And not to Shimshon's father, I would add, just to Shimshon's mother. The reason for that, I think, is twofold in the case of Shimshon. One is that the father is a complete blithering idiot. So that, that's number one. He's a fool. That's one. But the second point, which is very important, is because the mother is significant in the sense we don't have the mother talking to Shimshon either. But since Shimshon is a Nazir, not from birth, Shimshon is a Nazir before he's born. He's born a nausea. And that's why the mother can't drink wine. Because the wine that she drinks will be sustaining the child. So the child is a nausea from birth. The mother can take haircuts. Because that, her haircut doesn't affect the child. So she can go to the beauty salon, whatever she wants to do. But the point is, but she can't drink wine. She can't eat certain things. She has to be careful what she eats. Because the child is already in, in utero is already a um, is already a Nazarite. And in fact, the, she's informed this before he's conceived. 
you're going to have a child. I want you to tell you, tell you, even maybe from now, whatever, you can't do anything that will affect the fetus because the child is a Nazarite before he's born. Now, that's very similar to what you have over here. The term etzachah ba'beten yedaticha, or the term tetzei mirechem mikdashticha, that is very similar. In the case of Shimshon, it's even more striking, actually, for the following reason, and that is, because Shimshon actually is a is a is a Nazarite, and a Nazarite in the Torah, how do you become a Nazarite? You take a vow. Neder nozir. A Nazarite is a function of a vow. And in the Chumash, there's two things that are very interesting about that. First of all, you're not a Nazarite from birth. You can't be a Nazarite from birth because you have to take a vow. And the second point about the Chumash is that the, na- the vow in the Chumash that the Nazarite takes, according to the plain reading of the chapter 6 of Bamidbar is limited. It's a lim- The Chumash spends about as much time talking about how you end the vow as how you start it. Even more time. It spends a lot of time on how you complete the vow of the Nazarite. So it's obvious in the Torah that the Nazarite is a limited situation, limited time situation, which the Torah certainly permits, maybe even encourages, but it certainly permits it. But it's limited in time. At the end of the Nazarite vow, you go back to your previous situation. Now, in the case of Shimshon, what is remarkable is two things. First of all, he took no vow. Nobody took a vow, actually. The Nazarite status is imposed from without. That's number one. And number two, Shimshon is not a Nazarite on a temporary basis. He's a Nazarite for them before he's born until he dies. So that actually is very interesting. In the case of Yirmiyahu, he doesn't choose to be a prophet. He's informed that you were chosen to be a prophet and not just from birth. You were chosen to be a prophet before you were born. Even before you, at Tzachar even before you were formed, you were chosen to be a prophet. Now that parallel, by the way, one parallel does not contradict the other parallels. But that's a very interesting parallel, I think, to think about in terms of Yirmiyahu. And before we get to thinking about this more deeply, I would make a different point that the prophet and the Nazarite have something in common. Take, for example, the book of Amos, which is also a Haftorah, right? In the beginning of Amos, he talks about uh, the sins of Israel and how they prevented others from doing the right things. You gave the Nazarites wine to drink. And to the prophets you said, you shall not prophesy. So in that verse of Amos, it's very striking that he cites two things. He cites the, the Nazarite and he cites the prophet and he somehow suggest that there's a common element to the Nazarite on one hand and to the prophet on the other. Maybe a kind of closeness to God. The Nazarite is very close to God. The prophet is very close to God. And the people have <coughs> made it impossible for the Nazarite or the prophet to make these connections. So that's interesting in its own right. But there's something else very striking about, yeah. I was just going to say, in the Nazarite vow, it says, Ko yimein Israel kadoshu la Hashem, and here we have hikdash ticha. That's right, right. Hikdash ticha is a good word. In fact, in modern Hebrew, when they talk about these stories, they talk about the uh, the uh, hakdasha, they call it. The hakdasha, is, that's the term they use. Consecration. The consecration. Now, you're right, though, in pointing out, good point, that it is, there is a hakdasha over here. So the term say, tzei rechem hikdash ticha. So there's something about it. And the Nazarite, of course, is Kadosh. And that's, that's true. So I think it's very interesting. I think it actually raises some very interesting and maybe troubling questions. Uh, it certainly raised a troubling question for our hero, Yemiyo. Why me, he says, you know. He says it many times. Maybe you could find somebody else. 
But the point of the Shimshon story, which I'm about to teach soon, one of the main points is this, that in the story of, this is actually very important for the Shimshon story. Shimshon isn't born a Jew, actually. He's not born a Jew. In other words, yes, his mother is Jewish, he got that. But there's no sense in the Shimshon narrative on any level that he's actually Jewish. He doesn't function as a Jew in the story. He doesn't live amongst the Jew. He doesn't marry the Jews. He doesn't interact with the Jews at all. In fact, in the entire story of Shimshon, he has only one interaction with the Jewish people. The interaction is when the leaders of the tribe of Judah say to him, we're going to hand you over to be killed. He says, please don't kill me yourselves. Just, just hand me over, but don't kill me. Oh, we're not going to kill you. So they tie him up, at which point he breaks out of the bonds and he kills the Philistines. That's the sum total of the interaction of Shimshon with the Jewish people. The entire story is about the Philistines. And the point of the story actually is, in my view, that he's, he's, he's not born a Jew. He's not born a non-Jew either. <clears throat> he's born a Nazarite. He's a Nazarite, it's different. And the Nazarite has his own set of rules, actually. So in other words, the question, all of Shimshon's <clears throat> behavior with the Philistine, the Philistine women and all that stuff, how does the text see it? And my position is, there's no problem with it. There's no problem because he has his own shulchan aruch. As long as he does what God, he has his own, he's a, he has a single particular task. <laughs> He has to carry out that task, and that's the barometer through which we measure if Shimshon's doing the right thing or the wrong thing. It's a single-minded purpose. I mentioned that in the parallel to Yirmiyahu, because I think it's very similar. I think what God is saying to Yirmiyahu is, you were created for a particular purpose. One purpose. It's not a matter of choice, actually. You don't choose to be born. You were created for a particular purpose. And your purpose is to be my prophet. Your purpose is to speak my word. And that is, and God says to, uh, to Yirmiyahu, who complains, uh, God says in the continuation, um, one second, I'm, let's find that verse. Yes, verse number eight. Al ti rabit nehem. Do not be afraid. Ki itcha ani wa hatsilcha nuom Hashem, for I will save you. I don't know about you, but if someone says, "Don't be afraid, I will save you," that's when you start being afraid. What do you mean, save me? Save me from what? I'm delivering a message. I'm, no, but the message is clear. The message you're going to be delivering will not be a popular message, and it's going to be dangerous, actually but I'm going to be with you and save you. It's actually very similar to Shimshon. Shimshon is chosen for one reason, actually. He's not chosen to save the Jewish people. In fact, when you study the story of Shimshon, this is a very important point. The people have no interest in being saved altogether. They have zero interest. They're perfectly happy with the Philistines. It's what Judah says, the tribe of Judah says to Shimshon. Don't you know the Philistines are the rulers? What are you making trouble for? The people couldn't care less. They don't cry out to God for help. Only one is concerned. One being is concerned with the Philistines. That's God. God doesn't like the Philistines. <laughs> You're beating up on my people. You, you, this is my territory, you know? And so God is going to appoint someone to fight God's battle. No one's interested in fighting God's battle. The people are totally happy with the Philistines. So God creates someone who is God's creature and it was created to carry out God's will. And it's dangerous. Because if you fight the Philistines, they're gonna to try to kill you, which they do on more than one occasion. But God is gonna protect Shimshon as long as Shimshon stays in God's good, good, good graces. Now he makes the mistake of, of, of telling the secret and his hair gets cut. The problem is not cutting his hair. The problem is telling the secret. But that's, you can't be intimate with anybody. It's a terrible life if you think about it. And I'm thinking about this actually about Jeremiah. Because one of the things that Jeremiah is told in this book actually is he can't marry. He's not allowed to marry. 
ought to have children. He's not allowed to. It's told explicitly. You may not marry, you may not have children. You have to live alone because all the children are going to die, God says to him. And therefore, you can participate in that. You have to live, you're a, a completely solitary figure. And that is very reminiscent of Shimshon. Shimshon is totally alone. He can have 50 women around him. It makes no difference. He's totally alone. It's, that's, not, that's not relevant. He is completely and totally alone. And therein lies part of the interesting part of the Shimshon story. People don't want to be alone. People want companionship in one form or another. And sometimes when you seek companionship, you seek it in the wrong places. And that's the story of Shimshon and, and Delila, basically. And from a human standpoint, it's very powerful. So the, so the person, Jeremiah, and the person, Samson, are very similar. And I think it raises some very interesting questions about the way God runs the world, basically. Because what God is saying to Shimshon and Yermio, or indirectly to Shimshon, explicitly to Yermio, you were born for this purpose. It's a very dangerous purpose. It's a thankless task. And it's a tragic figure. Tragic. Yeah, but this is, this is my will. And, and, and Yermio accepts it, actually. I, when I say he accepts it, it doesn't mean he doesn't complain about it. He complains about it in very striking terms. There's no other prophet like this who actually wouldn't have attracted me to your meo. Find him a very real person. This is my job. I, I do it. I carry out my, my job because I'm commanded to do so. But it's, I, but, I, but, it's, but it's a tragedy for me on a human level. And that's part of the story. So the Shimshon and your meo parallel, I think, is very instructive for us. I think it's something to think about. So we have five examples. We have Moshe and Shmuel are two, Mishael is three, Yemiel, of course, is four, and then we finally we have the Shimshon story. Again, one does not contradict the next, but they each, each of them is informative for us, and actually the character of, the idea of being chosen for a particular task, whether it's a, whatever the task may be, I mean, I would say that, by the way, what time is it? I have absolutely no idea. Is it 11 o'clock? 11.20. 11.20, oh. Moshe is very similar in that respect. Moshe is chosen for a particular task. His task is to be the leader. His task is to take Israel out of Egypt. His task is to prepare Israel to enter the land. And then at the end of the 40 years, as we read fairly recently, uh, he is told that he's to ascend the mountain, to look into the land. You can see it. You're going to die. And Moshe turns to God earlier and says, well, maybe I can cross over to the other side. Right? And God says to Moshe, Rav Loch, you know, you can't. And, and by the way, don't even talk to me about it. Seeing this matter is nothing, there's no conversation. And Moshe addresses God many times on behalf of the people, prays for the people, etc. God is very willing to listen. When it comes to this particular thing, God says, no, because that's not your job. Your job is this. You completed your work. I have no use for you anymore, basically. So therefore, it's over. And that's similar to what you have in the case of Shimshon and Yermio, actually. So we, as we get to study the book of Yermio, we bear this in mind. This will surface constantly in the book. Now, we're not going to do every chapter and verse yet. We're going to jump around, but we'll start, we'll start with the beginning. So this is the God's promise. I'll tee rob it, Nahem. Don't be afraid. For I, am with, I, I will save you. Let's see lecha is always, without exception, means there's trouble ahead, yeah? I was just struck with when we're comparing Moshe to Yemiyahu, that when God talks to Moshe about his mission, he says that the Ered Lahat Mitzrayim, that God is going to save the people from right. Mitzrayim. But we know that Yemiyahu is not going to be a Matzil because God says to him, I'm going to, don't worry, I'll save you. That's right. But his mission is not to That's save the point. people. Right. Let me, let me just... Um, right. Well, the point is, the beginning of the book says he prophesied during the days of Yoshio, Yehoiakim, and Sikio. We're going to come back to that just to get the, the just to get the record straight about what he prophesies and who are the kings. We'll get there. I made the point in the beginning; he actually prophesies even beyond that. Let me make one last point before we stop, and that is the continuation in verse number ten. God said to Yirmiyo, "Riehiv kaneticha hayom I appoint you today. I chose you earlier. 
but I appoint you on this day, over nations and kingdoms, so he used, God uses six verbs over here. Lintosh is to uproot. Lintosh is to break down. Ravid is to destroy. Laros is also to overthrow or to, or to break. Livnot, Lintosh, to build and to plant. So this is the mission. God uses six verbs. Now the first thing that's very interesting is four of them are negative. Mm-hmm. Let's start with that. Of the six verbs, Four of the verbs, two-thirds of them, are negative words. You are here to destroy, to break down, right? Two of them are positive. So that already sets up in the book what, what is true. Most of the book are prophecies of destruction, of doom, etc. But it's not 100% that way. There is always a, a glimmer of hope. There's talk about restoration, talk about return, talk about even in the present how to make it work. Well, this is the God's description, and the book of Yirmiyo will come back to this puzzle several times. Let me, I'll make one other point about the book of Yirmiyo, a general point about Sefer Yirmiyo, which is that probably more than any other prophet, the book of Yirmiyo has certain stock phrases. It comes back to many times, 10 times, 12 times, 21 times. And he's capable of poetry. It's not that he can't write. But part of, it's very interesting as a, as a preacher, you know what I mean? Part of being a teacher or a preacher is that sometimes you actually repeat. You go back to what, you know, there's the different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, different styles when it comes to teaching. One is to come back to the same message. He has, those three things. There'll be plague, there'll be famine, there'll be sword. Because many times in the book. Keep repeating that over and over again. And... That's true of many, many phrases in the book. So we, 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 we encounter that. That's part of the style. Of, he has a particular style. Yeshayel has a different style. Uh, and we'll, 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 we will see. In any event, this is the first part of the chapter. And now the continuation. We'll stop in a couple of minutes. And now we have two other prophecies of Yermio. Not prophet, well, sort of prophecies. Verse 11. And in both of them, both in verse 11 and in verse 13, the question is asked of Yimio, what do you see? It almost sounds like God is giving him a training exercise, you know? What do, what do you see over here? You know, you have to be able to see. It's because there's the vision that you have, and there's the interpretation of the vision. So it starts with, because he's true. He's never prophesied. He knows nothing about it. So let me give you a little bit, part of the initiation is in chapter one. What do you see? I see a makel, which is a strange term, but makel means of a stick. And they translate a branch of an almond tree. Makel shokeid. And God said, you've seen well. He shokeid ani. For I am shokade. Now, what does shokade mean? In modern Hebrew, you have the word shokade. How would you translate shokade in modern Hebrew? I don't Hebrew? know enough English to translate it. Translate into Hebrew. <laughs> yeah. God is um, to stick to something yeah. without any interruption. That's like right. To right. Dedicate, right. Right. Fully concentrate. Right. You have in the yeshiva sometimes. Yeah. Someone who sits and learns the whole time. He's a shakta. Yeah. He's a shakta means. Doesn't Nothing bothers him. He's theory. focused on the learning, and everything else is out. That's the shaktan. Here, it's actually interesting. There is, and I'll stop with this thought. There is a play on the word shokade. Now, we we we, we know the word shokade already from the chumash. No, makel shokade. We know makel shokade from the chumash exactly. Makel shokade. Everybody put their mate, right? And the one who's chosen, Aaron is chosen. And it says, by your state seeds, by Moshekedim. Now, there's something about almonds. Maybe, maybe you don't know this about almonds. Almonds blossom very quickly. Actually, the first fruits are almonds. Almonds come very quickly. What? Shkedi Aparachat. Shkedi Aparachat, exactly. So the almond, actually, 
Shokela Barila Asoto means more than I am focused to do it, but it means something else to your Mio, which is I, I choose you today. And the point I think to your Mio is listen, I could give you a 12 year training exercise, you know what I mean? Here's the problem we got. The work, show up nine o'clock tomorrow morning. The work starts now. That's Shokel Al Barila Soto. Your mission, not should you choose to accept it because you have no choice. Your mission is now. So we need a crash course. Is it, what do you see? What do you see? But the, the main message is that this young prophet, he's a now, he's, he's a youngster. We don't know if he's 15, 17, we don't know what he is, but he's young. And the job begins right now. And the job is difficult and dangerous and largely negative, but not completely negative. All of that is, I think, implied. So we will continue. Yes, so people have taken root and can't change. Also That's also very Right. That, that is a good point. Undo that, right. that is very true. And that's one of the main, I would say, frustrations in the book oh. and the frustration of the prophet. I'll just say with the following thought about the prophet changing. You know, Jeremiah is 52 chapters long. The last story is they go down to Egypt, the end of the book. And they, Yermio says, listen, why would you worship idols in Mitzrayim? You see how much trouble we got into. And they respond, unbelievable. the end of the book, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? When we worship the idols, things were good. That was good. It's the stopping worshiping idols, that's the problem. That's what they say to them in Mitzrayim. So after all the 50 chapters or so, it's got to scratch your head, you know, and you say, after all that, what did he actually accomplish, you know? There's only one prophet, actually, only one. He's the most successful prophet who ever lived. Most successful guy who ever lived. Yeah. Yonah. Yonah, of course. He gets on a boat, he's running away. He gets on a boat, a bunch of sailors. By the time he gets off the boat, they're all davening. Everybody's davening. In fact, how come you're sleeping? Why don't you pray? You know what I mean? And then he goes to Ninveh. He's a very short statement. 40 days, you're all dead. That's it. 40 days, you're dead. And then the king gets off his throne. And they're wearing, and wearing sackcloth. And the animals are wearing sackcloth. And the animals are crying out. The king is crying out. And by Yenachem Hashem. I always wondered about that. And I'll end with these, something that sounds funny. I don't think it's a joke, actually. I'll tell you the difference between the two, between them. What I believe, you know, sometimes you see kids in the park, you know, little kids. And the mother says to a kid, why did you hit Johnny? The kid keeps hitting Johnny. The kid understands something. The mother doesn't give a damn about Johnny. Not only that, the mother likes the fact that the kid is tough. You know what I mean? But the, kid, the mother says, don't do it. But the kid understands. She doesn't really mean it. And sometimes it, the parent does mean it, you know? And the kid stops. And here's the point about Yona. Jeremiah and all the others, deep down, have a profound love of the Jewish people. They don't actually want the bad things to happen. Even Yermio gets very angry at times, but fundamentally, he doesn't want it to happen. That's not true of Yonah. Yonah's praying very hard, they're all destroyed. And they know when he says it, he means it. There's no other way to interpret it. 40 days, it, it's all, you're all dead, and I pray to God it happens, you know? So they hear that very well and they get off their throat. That's my take on it. So we'll stop we'll stop here. So next next week we will continue with Yermio. It's not always exciting, but it's important. Okay.